welcome once again to those who are joining us for worship today, as well as people who are with us online in our online community. It's good you could be with us. When's the last time you looked up? I had been out of town for about a week and uh, came back and all the family things that needed to get done, working on those things, as well as some of the church things that needed to be worked on. And I didn't actually get out of my house for another couple days, really, working on all these other things. When I finally did and I was driving into church, I saw something that struck me. I was waiting at a stoplight and I looked up and there it was. A beautiful crown of snow all the way around the Inland Empire. All the tips of the mountains just sparkling in all their beauty. It really struck me just how much of a contrast there was going on. Normally you look around, there's traffic, there's cars and other buildings. And even the little hills that are next to you, filled with rocks and thorns and thistles and some of those tumbleweeds. But then when you look beyond that and you see that beautiful, pure, white, crystal snow, it's awesome. And certainly fitting in December to see a little bit of snow. But it's also fitting for another reason. I was just thinking of that contrast and thinking about what December is like. It's It's a month of contrast. You have... Christmas parties, you have presents you need to shop for, you have uh, family members to visit with, you have all sorts of things to do for preparation. So much so that it gets stressful, it gets tiring, it gets exhausting. But then at the end of it, you finally get to relax. You finally get to lift your eyes up and see your family there or your friends or you gather in church and worship around a manger scene and you remember how God sent his son into this world for you and for me, and to bring peace. It's certainly a big contrast. A contrast that I think we would do well to notice at this part of December when we're running around, so that we remember there are times we need to just lift our eyes up and remember the peace and the reason why we're planning and doing all this preparation. To do that, we're going to get into Isaiah. Isaiah is a book in the Old Testament of prophecy. And just to get a quick definition down as we're going into it, prophecy is a message from God. Just real simple definition. Prophecy is a message from God. Um, Prophecy is a message of God. Sometimes it has to do with events that are happening right there in the moment of the prophet in the Old Testament or New Testament. Sometimes it's something that's coming soon or sometimes it's something that's way, way, way off in the future. Prophecy is a message from God coming through a person. Our message today is through Isaiah. Isaiah, a guy that's living in a time in the nation of Israel where it was really rough. They had um, a lot that they were blessed with. The economy was doing really well. But morally, there was a deficit. They were hurting. Judges were taking bribes. And they were letting the um, innocent people um, go to jail. They also were letting guilty people off the hook. It was not good. Very corrupt. It was also corrupt in their marketplace. People were diluting the wine that they were selling. The scales were dishonest. And the Lord watched as his people, whom he brought out of Egypt, who he rescued, were wandering after all sorts of other things, including other gods. So God has his message through the prophet Isaiah that there's going to be consequences for this and there's going to be hard times to come. And through those things, people will be brought to their knees, to repentance, to a Savior who still loves them. So that's the prophecy that Isaiah was working on, that he was getting ready for, and that we touch on today in our preparations this December. He starts off in Isaiah 9, 2, saying, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You can notice two things that pop up in there. There's light and there's darkness. A lot of darkness that Isaiah could have seen as he looked around. You know, much like you're sitting at a stoplight and you look over and you see cars, you see businesses, you even see the rolling hills that are close by and there's thorns and there's thistles, and it's rough. But to really appreciate the darkness Isaiah is talking about, he was in a time frame when there wasn't the light pollution that we have today and that he could go out and there would be pitch dark. I think to appreciate that darkness, you really have to understand um, what it is to be in the dark. In sunny California, you don't have it during the day. And even at nighttime, you have all these lights that are on, on street corners and cars and businesses. But if you were to go maybe down into a cave 
Or better yet, to go on one of those tours where they take you down an old mine shaft, you go a mile or two down below, then you would understand what real darkness is like. Maybe some of you have actually been in that situation where you've gone on a tour like that. And the tour guides, they love to, once you get down there, let everybody know, in a couple minutes, we're going to turn off the lights. And then they cut the lights. And you know just how deep darkness can be. When you hold your hand in front of your face and you can feel your breath, but you can't see your fingers. Darkness that it kind of just, you can feel it. It's thick. That's the kind of darkness Isaiah is referring to. And he's connecting that kind of penetrating darkness to the darkness, the moral deficiencies that they had in their culture at the time. I think we can relate. You know, looking out at our dark world in which we live, there's a whole bunch of different ways in which people have wandered from the truth of God's word. They've pursued their passions and they're now feeling maybe the darkness that it brings. Of course, that's the world out there, but that's also something that creeps into our lives and threatens to crush us as well. Well, that darkness, living in the land of darkness, is kind of painful too. If you've ever been up in the middle of the night and you've had to go across your hallway and you've got little ones, you know what it's like to trip on those toys or to step on a Lego. It's painful. Or, or in, when darkness is in your room and you're making your way across and your shin hits the corner, that metal edge on your bed, that's painful. Darkness brings pain. And, and not, not just, just pain, it also brings fear. When I, when I tuck my little ones in at night, some of the most sweetest, innocent things, they become terrifying to them. Like the stuffed little bears, a little penguin, or the clothes that's hanging in the, in the closet, they all of a sudden transform into something terrifying when it's dark. These are the comparisons that Isaiah is drawing for us as we gather this December to think about moral deficiency, to talk, th- talk about how when people stray from following Christ as their Savior with other substitutes, the darkness it brings. But Isaiah brings good news. He says that the people walking in darkness, on those living in the land of deep darkness, a light is dawned. So he's saying, basically, God promising light and joy for those living in darkness and distress. I think that's really encouraging, especially if right now you're feeling a little overwhelmed with all the to-do lists, things that need to get done. Or... If you're out there looking at the news and you're wondering what in the world is happening in our nation, in our country, in our community, is God still in control? Here's his promise, light and joy for those in darkness and distress. So what is that going to look like? Well, here's some more descriptors. When that light comes, it'll be as in the days of Midian's defeat. You shatter the yoke of the burdens, what burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressors. Doesn't that sound great? Doesn't that sound wonderful? Midian's defeat, yoke of the oppressors, rod. Those illustrations maybe don't speak to us as much this, this year, 2019. Let's explore them just to understand what Isaiah was getting to. The rod of their oppressors, I think that's the most easiest to understand. The rod of the oppressors, they would have rods that they would use to drive their servants or their slaves to do the bidding that they wanted to when a foreign power conquered someone. God says he's going to take that away. And the relief from that is like the light coming into the world. He talks about a yoke that burdens them. The yoke was something that you put on an animal in which they would have right around their shoulders and in the morning they would have a plow hook to them and all day they would drudge back and forth over a field, uh, just dragging that plow through that field, tearing it up. You can imagine the, the calluses that would form, the muscles that would be sore from carrying around the burden of a yoke. Just imagine a human being doing that. God says, just like taking that yoke off, and not just taking it off, but breaking it to pieces, will be like the light that he's bringing into this world. It'll be just like the days when Midian was defeated. That one probably needs the most explanation. The days when Midian was defeated. Well, that goes way back to the period of the judges. God's people had wandered from him, and he allowed the Midianites to come in, and they came in in force. They're described as coming in like hordes of locusts, just filling up the valley and devouring all the crops that the Israelites had tended throughout the year. 
so that there was very little left for them. They had even retreated from their normal homes and they'd gone up into the mountains and lived in caves because the Midianites had been overwhelming them and taking all their stuff, all their food, all their supplies. They were brought really low to be at a point where they would reach out to the Lord. And they did. They cried out to the Lord and God called Gideon to lead them to defend them against the Midianites. So Gideon amassed a huge army. He got about 32,000 people. Not too shabby. Although it was still a smaller force than the people of the Midianites, the, the, the soldiers that they had. Well, the Lord looked on that big number and he said, no, it's too many, Gideon. And so tell the people, if anybody's scared, that they can go home. And he told the people and the soldiers, 22,000 of them left, leaving only 10,000. Which is still a pretty, pretty big number, but still smaller compared to the people of Midian. The Lord said, there's still too many people. If the people go with 10,000, they're going to think that it's by their hand and their power that they defeat the people of Midian. So, instead of that, I want you to go to a river with them, Gideon. Take the 10,000 soldiers and watch them as they refresh themselves and drink from the, spr- the stream along the river. And those who stoop down and surp up the water with their mouth, you can let those go home. But take those who take their hand down and scoop it up and drink from their hand. Take those. Those will be your soldiers. He did that. And there were only 300 left. God had really thinned out their numbers, their soldiers, their army. But he said, Gideon, now those are your soldiers and you can go out and you will be victorious over the people of Midian and then Israel won't have to worry about starving to death any longer. So he headed out. And Gideon got ready for battle. He told those 300 soldiers to have their sword on their side and then to take a trumpet in their hand and their other hand to take a a torch with a clay jar over top of it and to go with him in the middle of the night to the hills that were around the Midianites encampment. They got up there and they were scared. There were tents everywhere. Those Midianites, they really did look like locusts just swarming through that valley. Their army, their soldiers all ready for battle just waiting at a moment's notice to pounce. But around one or two, three in the morning, early in the morning, he had his soldiers go into groups. And he gave them strict orders. He said, when I give the signal, what I want you to do is to take your horn and blast as loud as you can and then shatter that jar, hold your torch high and shout out, for the Lord and for Gideon. And that's exactly what they did. They broke off into groups. They spread out around the upper hills around the camp of the Midianites. And at just the right time, they pulled out their horns and they blasted their trumpets and they broke the jar and the torches blazed and they yelled out, For the Lord and for Gideon! And they kept repeating that and blasting their trumpets. And then down in the valley, the Midianites heard this noise. They looked up in the darkness and they saw the fire on the hills and they were terrified. They grabbed for their swords. They came out of their tents and they started fighting with whomever they saw and they came in contact with, which was their own men. They fought against each other for a little while and then they got scared and they ran for the hills and they didn't come back. And God gave them a huge victory. A victory that they couldn't possibly claim as their own because they only had 300 people. And that's what Isaiah is referencing. When the Midianites were destroyed, that's what it's going to be like when the Lord brings light into this period of darkness. Some small force that God's going to work mightily through. And then he moves into the passage that is the theme and is the focus for today. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. Here it is, a small force that is going to be mightily powerful because behind this child is the power of God. And you can see that described in the, in the words that are used after, the names that this child will carry. Not that this child would be named these names exactly, but this is the characteristics and qualities this child would have. This child would be a wonderful counselor. When we think about a counselor, we think about somebody who you go to when you need advice. 
And wonderful sounds like they're nice or friendly, but the real meaning behind wonderful is that they're, they're filled with wonder. Like, whoa, I can't believe it. That makes such good sense, that advice you give. Perfect guidance is what this child would bring. And you look into the New Testament and you hear these words of Jesus on the, the Sermon on the Mount or his parables or the other times he's teaching people and you do see he has perfect guidance. He's a wonderful counselor. He's also a mighty God. Mighty God is the idea of the Lord of hosts. Picture, if you will, an angel with huge wings, dressed for battle with his sword drawn and filled with armor. This is the Lord that has legions and legions of these angels at his command. As powerful as they might look, God is that much bigger. This child would be all-powerful. All-powerful, true God. This child would be considered everlasting father. Now, I know many of us maybe didn't experience what it's like to have a good father. Or maybe, for some, you even experienced a bad father. Even if that's the case, we can still understand what it is to have a good father or what a good father is supposed to look like. A good father is somebody who is a caretaker. He watches over. Well, this child would be someone who would be enduring in care, an everlasting father, somebody you could always go to, somebody you could always talk to, somebody who would genuinely listen and do something. This child would also be a prince of peace, royalty, prince of peace. Normally, when you think about a kingdom, it's established by warriors going to battle and fighting and bloodshed and tanks and guns. But this royal prince, this child, would establish his kingdom as a better kingdom, one of peace, unique, unlike anything else. Prince of peace. I think the biggest way that you can see that his kingdom was different is not only in the way he was born, in the humble way Jesus was placed in a, in a, in a manger, most likely in a stable, you see in his whole life, and then when he gave his life on a cross, his service was not about him. It was about whom he came to serve, us, his people, the people living in the land of darkness, the people who give themselves over into darkness. He came to be their light, a light that shines, that shines on a cross and a hill far away, a light that shines when it comes back from death. A light that shines beautiful when he ascends into glory and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, which means, which we understand, that Jesus is ruling all things on behalf of his people, of us. He's a prince of peace for a better kingdom, for an eternal one, one that means peace with God, and that leads us to have peace with people around us, even when we're extremely stressed. Here's, here's this, uh, another reminder that passage that's such a big focus in Isaiah chapter 9. To us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. Something I didn't mention yet, two little letters, one little word. The child is born, the son is given. Isaiah is talking about this some 700 years before Jesus would be born. And yet he talks about it in the present. See, when God gives a promise, it's as good as done. He speaks in the present because even though it's 700 years from now, he believes it's happened. He has confidence looking forward in God's promise. He can lift his eyes from some of the moral filth and darkness around him, even from his own life, and he can look up to God's promise and say, yep, it's as good as done. Pretty sweet pretty sweet, especially when you understand what that kingdom's all about. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The ruling that Jesus has is not short-lived. It's not temporary. It's peace that lasts. You know, you think about any moment where you have peace. You think about Christmas morning even when the kids get up and they're opening presents and they're, they're excited to see family or friends. That's special. 
but it ends. And it usually ends with piles of paper on the floor, missing pieces from the new um, game they got, or putting together bicycles that don't quite fit just right, or technology that's a little buggy. Uh, Peace on this world is kind of short-lived, except for Jesus' kingdom. Because his peace is one that comforts us even in the middle of the storms. Even when things don't quite fit right, we still know we're right with God. Because he's vanquished our sin, he's conquered our guilt, and he quiets our fears. Peace is what we long for, and now peace is what we lift our eyes to, especially this December. Because you know December is not a new thing. It happens every year. And you know what is coming around the corner. You're going to have moments where you're going to get frustrated and angry. You're going to get moments where you might shout or stress or flip out or just plain be sad in despair over people who aren't with you this Christmas. Here's where Jesus' kingdom fits. Here's where we need this reminder. So answer this for yourself. Where do you want to see the kingdom of peace most this December? Do you want to see it when you're sad or depressed or getting angry or frustrated? Do you want to see it when you're at home, when you're at work, when you're in the car, when you're on vacation, when you're waiting in line? When do you want to see it most? And I'd say practically, write down the passage we focused on today. Isaiah 9 verse 6. To us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. His authority, his power of all things is right here. He's got it. Write that down for yourself and then fold it up and put it in your pocket next to your phone so every time you pull it out, you're reminded. And when you get to those moments when you really need it, it's right there. As a reminder that this may look rough right now, but we lift our eyes up. We lift our eyes up to the hills. And even if there's not snowy mountains there right now, there's his peace and his kingdom to live in and to look forward to. This is our season of hope in which we build this anticipation for Christmas. God bless you in this. Amen.